is uh, less than one week. Hmm? Less than one week away, Jack. Hmm? One, one week from... I guess it's Sunday now. <laughs> so, mm. le- so like half a week away. Hmm. You eating a peanut butter sandwich? I'm talking about Comic-Con, by the way. I'm going to be in Comic-Con mm. this next week. <laughs> Start- <laughs> starting... <laughs> <laughs> starting uh, on Friday, traveling to San Diego on Thursday. Very excited. Very, very exciting. So excited that, Doug, why aren't you meditating right now? I thought we were going to do that whole thing, weren't we? This is very confusing. This is Comics Covered. <laughs> That's a great segue. Uh, for anyone who's still listening, uh, for the week of July 11th, 2018, this is episode 34. Here on Comics Covered, we talk about comic books and the world around them. The comics industry, comic movies, TV, g- games once no a games. year. We talk about... Never. Not, not this week. Uh, we'll also talk spoilers about uh, the books we read uh, or anything else. We will give you specific warnings if there's any other movie stuff or whatever. We'll talk details about. Uh, and we'll probably swear. Uh, yes. Jack contends that we don't swear as much as we think we do. I think we swear more than he thinks we do. You go back and forth on that. Sometimes you have the same idea as me, like to want like an intern going back to see that. But then the first time I uh, mentioned that we probably don't swear mm-hmm. during every episode, you're very against the fact that we don't that we swear during every episode, or at least you do, because I don't know. You have this weird version of yourself that you think that right, you're. Let some me get the, let me get the intern on that, Barry. Barry, can you can you roll back the tape? He's rolling the tape back. Okay, it's gonna take him about doing these days. It's gonna take him about two hours to do. So uh, we'll we'll listen to that tape as soon as he's t- he's doing it manually with like a, he's got a trackball. Wait, it's very technical. Two Don't hours worry about it. to go through thirty three episodes that are all like about two hours. You know, now that I think about it, it's uh, it's actually uh, he's, he's very, very is very the vision. He's oh, very fast. it's Barry Allen. It, you know what? It is Barry Allen. Mm-hmm. He's you tried, you didn't try to do that, did you? you? What now? You tried to do that. You didn't even try to do that, did you? No. No, I, I did. <laughs> I did do it. Uh, Actually, can we talk about one thing? Have they made a comic about The Last of Us? About The Last of Us? Ah, yeah. That seems like a thing that would have had like a spinoff comic or something. I know there have been Uncharted comics, but I don't think there's been a Last of Us comic. I would read the shit out of it if it was well done, you know? I mean, I'd read anything if it was well done. That's not true. Okay. Probably not. Yes. Uh, um, so, I'm Doug. I'm a resident comics veteran. Uh, for oh. example... What now? <gasps> you said veteran. That's so great. Oh, boy. Yes. Uh, closest thing we've got, anyway. For example, I know uh, a comic book character who my co-host, Jack, might not know. And that character is Machine Man. Ooh, Machine Man. I like it. Okay, my name's Jack. And uh, I am a more recent convert. Um, I'm doing some research right now. Not research online, but research from... um, Oh, here we go. Because I have an idea of who this character is. You did research? What is this bullshit? No, I didn't do research. I did research of our texts this morning. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, you misunderstand me. You misunderstand okay. me. All right, what did you I didn't look, look anything up on the internet. I'm just deducing what this uh, character is from okay, based sure. on your mistake by asking me something. I today. wanted to make sure I wasn't <laughs> doing a character you already knew. <laughs> right. This is thrilling radio. <laughs> In any uh, case, Machine Man is a character <laughs> from a 2001 Space Odyssey comic that is written by Grant Morrison. It is not. Um, oh. Also, I had a really great idea. Okay. What is it? Um, oh, crap. Uh, it was something about this section and making it better. Um, <laughs> darn it. Something this bit here is definitely doing. Oh, oh, okay. oh, I know. I know. I know what it was. Um, I thought that it'd be really cool if in the future... You asked me questions about a group or character or something, and but you didn't give me the name. And then based on, or told me like random things, and I guessed the name based off of what you were asking me or telling me about the character. Wouldn't that be yeah, cool? That would be a fun variation on it. Maybe someday. 
Uh, Maybe someday. I've also thought it would be fun to, like, show you a picture of a character and have you guess things about them. uh, And then, like, like, post the picture to social media or something along with the episode. But That's good. uh, that's another variation we could do at some point. I like but that. anyways, so this character, okay, so Doug, I did give away a little bit of the game here. I texted Jack this morning asking, because uh, he's reading Super Gods by Grant Morrison right now. And uh, I wasn't, I for some reason have it in my head that he talks about this 2000 a Space Odyssey, 2001 a Space Odyssey book in that. He, he does might, talk and, about, he does talk about being brought to 2001 a Space Odyssey when he was a child and how he was thinking about space and stuff because of that. But I don't. He hasn't talked hmm. about a comic okay. or anything. Okay. Uh, maybe it's not in there, or maybe it is, and you just haven't gotten to it yet, because you're currently reading that. Great book, by the way. I'm, on, uh, I'm not even halfway through yet, so I don't even know. Yeah, it, might, it, might, be, it might still be in there. But, uh, so I did give that away a little bit. I wanted to make sure I wasn't doing a character Jack already knew. Uh, but <laughs> there are aspects to this that you will not be able to get. So, okay. So we know that this character, Machine Man, is from a 2001 A Space Odyssey book, which is strange considering you have, uh, uh, let's just tell the folks you have seen (laughs) 2001 A Space Odyssey, like any good (laughs) film enthusiast. And if if anybody listening hasn't seen it, you should see it because it's one of the best film experiences ever, I think. Okay. So, uh, if they did a two, there is no (laughs) Machine Man... (laughs) In the movie. Wait, as, are you, what are you talking about, Doug? Dear God. You don't remember the whole Machine Man theme? Uh, okay. So, uh, Machine Man uh, is part of the 2001 A Space Odyssey comic. Can you tell me what publisher published the Machine Man comic? Or, sorry, the 2001 A Space Odyssey comic. Okay, can we say that it's not Big Two? Uh, it is Big Two. Oh, God damn. Who are these people? Okay. Um, can you tell me the decade in which this was written? Uh, this was 70s. Uh, let's see. He debuted in... Okay. I'm going to say the that it's it going to be Marvel. I'm going to say Marvel. It is Marvel. Okay, uh, and uh, based on that time period and uh, the publisher, can you give me a guess as to who would have written a 2001 A Space Odyssey comic for Marvel? Uh, Jim Starlin? Uh, I feel like Jim Starlin would have been slightly after that, but good guess. Uh, okay. that, 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 that would, that would fit, but it was actually Jack Kirby. Oh, okay. Jack, so Jack I Kirby Jack wrote, Kirby wasn't there, like, for, I thought he went to DC before uh, that. Uh, when was, when was New Gods? I'm not sure. Uh, that was... Also 77. So I believe this was like... Oh. Possibly one of the last things he did at Marvel. Is Machine Man was like, the thing that drove him to go from Marvel to DC. Seems like it might have been split a little bit, his time, because this started in 77. Anyways. Huh. Okay, um, in any case, so Jack Kirby, we got that. Um, okay, what else you got? What else you got about Machine <laughs> so, Man? <laughs> so, okay. I don't know that I have much to guess about this. Okay, what would you guess a 2001 A Space Odyssey comic is? I guess it's... I have My questions are more about the comic itself. Okay. Then about machine. Is it man. really that silly of a comic? Like, was it a silly concept? It's, oh boy, you you just. I feel like you don't even have any idea. So okay, uh, wait. So is it at all about space exploration? Uh, it it, it yeah to yeah to a degree. Like, there's lots of space stuff in it. Uh, okay. Are there okay. any characters from the movie in this comic? I believe so. I believe uh there it includes characters. Uh, it's got the monolith. It's got, you know, I, uh, I'm not is, sure. Is the monolith about the it. character in and of itself, do you think? Nah, sort of. I think it, it does is drive dressed. change <laughs> in the plot, literally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's more of a character in this. Um, and, uh, how many, how long would you say a 2001 A Space Odyssey comic could last? 
I mean, I don't know what they're... Because I don't know if they, like... <laughs> they must do things that are not in the movie. They don't just recount the events of the movie. So, my guess it was a big thing at the time, 1977. So, um, like a drug-fueled era. So, I would say, like... Uh, let's give it 24 issues. Okay. So this was a, let's see. How many issues was this? It is a 10 issue series. Oh, uh, the first issue is the plot of the movie 2001, a space odyssey. (laughs) Just the first issue. The first issue is the plot. Uh, it's like a fucking space three hour house. movie boiled down into an Jack issue. Kirby drawing like frame, like images from the movie. Like he does, uh, like he's got the whole like the cavemen or monkeys or whatever are, are fighting Jesus. around the monolith. And does he do the walking around the circle space station thing? I'm yeah. not sure like how exact all of it is. And that's a pretty striking image. I feel like they should do that. Um, uh, but like, yeah, it's got them in the, in the future, like researching this monolith on the moon or, see, or finding it at least. Um, and then, so they did that. And it was, did they book. go through the whole ending of Space Odyssey? Yes. They, like, they have, Jesus. man oh, goes, wait, 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 like, no, no, no. If no one's seen it, we shouldn't spoil the, okay. what happens at the they end. They do the ending. Oh, Jesus. They do the whole, Crazy ending. Christ. I want to read uh, this. That then, sounds awesome. Okay, so this is, yeah, so this is a 2001 a Space Odyssey adaptation, single issue by Jack Kirby. Uh, really weird, okay? <laughs> yeah. Then they do a sec, then they just continue it. <laughs> like, from there? From the from, ending? From there. Uh, and so basically the comic becomes the monolith basically traveling oh. through time providing mm. technology to different eras. Jesus. Um, and then there's Mayan gods. Oh. And then in issue eight, we introduce this character Machine Man, and then the rest of the series is about Machine Man. It's Actually, I'm sorry, he's originally called Mr. Machine, and then they change his name for copyright reasons, but... Uh, uh-huh. And Machine Jesus. Man then go- goes on to get his own series and, uh, like, uh, and, uh, to this day, Machine Man, part of the Marvel Universe. What? He's, like, used still? Yep. Oh, that's bizarre. That's the weirdest origin. So, why? 2001, A Space Odyssey, the plot is of in the movie, canon with the Marvel Universe. Happened in the Marvel Universe. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, I guess there's no reason why it shouldn't be able to happen. But damn. It's just so weird because that first that first issue is such it's it's a licensed it's an adaptation of the movie. That is like so there's no weird. reason to think that that's in the Marvel universe. Yeah. And then it just it's. they reach the end and it's pretty much all about Machine Man by the end. He's just oh, by the way, Machine Man is a I mean, obviously, he's he's a robot. He's yes, yes, uh, like an experimental robot. Who's he's being hunted by the government. He can extend all his limbs like telescopically. Uh, that's like his big thing. Um, when you and, mean telescopically, uh, he can just extend like like a telescope is what you mean. Sorry, that was yeah. Dumb I mean, me. it's like basically like Mister Fantastic or whatever, but he can't like stretch his body other than like extending his limbs. Well, it sounds like an ex. ex- it sounds like a Inspector Gadget sort of extend limbs. Yeah, sort of. Right? Yeah. That kind of that kind of thing. Uh, okay. So, but then he goes on to have his own Marvel series. Jesus. In which his origin and everything is still a thing. So. <laughs> so like, does the mo- oh wait? Actually, you know what? Don't tell me. I'm gonna. I'm. Gonna, I'm really going to read this. This sounds <laughs> fantastic. Okay. So I wonder if they made the comic. And then they, like, were like, okay, you know, we should delve into this a little bit more. We should, you know, make more, right? Was it, or was it immediately they planned a series completely? I'm not entirely sure what the order is. Uh, I mean, you can look up, like, retrospectives or articles on on the history of this series. Uh, they did a very similar thing. Marvel did a lot of this kind of thing back in the day. They did a uh, Star Wars adaptation 
Well, they really Star Wars things to this day, don't they? Yeah, but I mean, they um, they did a Star Wars adaptation that I believe came out before the movie came out. Uh, uh, oh. And they didn't have all of the plot. <laughs> and so they just kind of made things up. And then it was an ongoing series. There's a green rabbit bounty hunter. <laughs> uh... I got to read more of this like old shit. This is awesome. It's ridiculous. Um, I love it. But that series went on for a while. Um yeah, so Did you read so did you have you read this stuff? Like all this no, stuff? No, I haven't. I have not read this one. Uh I just I just find the idea that 2001 a space odyssey happened in Marvel. <laughs> I read one I read one like comic thing um that was like a Star Wars thing. It was like the Thawne, Thrawn saga or something like mm-hmm. that. And sure. it like takes place directly after the episode uh, Return of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. And it was it was really interesting, actually. I don't know if I actually bought it. I think I might have gotten it at the library, which was weird. Have mm-hmm. you ever gotten comics at the library? Uh, I've checked out some comics from the library. Yeah, before. Huh. Read, it's uh... just, I mean, I guess it makes sense that they'd have it. But okay, getting back to Machine Man. Um... Are we okay? So, Jack Kirby does this whole does this whole series? I believe so. He does. He did. Uh, yep, yeah, all the way through the last one, and then okay. he wrote the Machine Man series. I believe after that, uh, okay. for a bit, and then someone else took over. Do people uh, do Machine Man still? Like, is where is he right now in the Marvel? The last unit? like really big thing with him was a Warren Ellis series called Next Wave Agents of Hate. <laughs> oh. Uh, which is a thing that I just ordered today. Oh, fun. Uh, because I was thinking about Machine You Man. ordered a lot today, didn't you? I ordered a bunch of stuff. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he... Let's see. His latest appearance... Oh, he's been in Domino. Uh, Gail Simone's Domino. So he's been appearing very recently. Oh, he was in Domino? Apparently. Apparently Aww. he was in the first issue. He must have been in the background. Oh, now that I think about it, I feel like I remember him being in the party scene in that first issue of Domino. Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, sure. Not a huge part, but I think he was there. Apparently he's in another issue, so... Damn. Um. Okay, cool, cool. Well, whatever. But awesome. I'm definitely going to check out that. Did you... Okay. Machine Man. That's mm-hmm. Good job, Doug. Good job, <laughs> Doug. Maybe next week we'll try one of our new ideas for this section, too, which is yeah. exciting. Uh, well, next week, we'll talk about that later. Oh, but. you're gonna- Oh, yeah! So, Doug, tell us about your excitement. What's- what's up? How are you- So, yeah, so I'm going to Comic-Con next week. I'm gonna be, uh, at the con, uh, Friday and Saturday. Wish I could be there longer, but that's- that's not all the time I've got, including travel and stuff, to get out there. Um, but, uh, Jack and I are not going to be able to do a, a show next week. Uh, well, here's the not- thing- so Samantha asked her people um, if, like, a last ditch effort to see if we could get in. So we're we're gonna see this week if we. Oh, can you maybe think you might it. still be able to get in? I mean, who knows? If they don't Breaking answer news. back, we're not gonna push it or anything. But you know, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what works. There's the possibility. There's a uh, chance. Cool. Well, all right. Well, maybe we will do an episode together. This is news to me. But uh, live with our sister podcast live show. Uh. With our sister podcast, uh, Mashing Buttons, I'm going out to, uh, the planned currently, as it stands, is I'm going out to the con with, uh, Brian and Matt from our friends over at Mashing Buttons, the podcast, uh, they do a podcast about games, if anyone's listened to the, I guessed it on an episode of theirs, Brian came on an episode of ours, uh, and, uh, I'm theoretically, the plan currently is for me to do a recording with them while I'm out there with them, uh, Jack mm-hmm. may or may not be on it then. <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. Who uh, knows? But uh, up in the air at the moment. Yeah. So very by excited way, for that. Uh, by the way, I always laugh a little bit internally when you say the con or going to a con. I think it's really funny. Why is that? That's what everyone calls them. I know, but I don't call them that. So I think it's funny because it's it's like a new term. It's like this new lingo slang thing that I like. Ooh, I'm going to the con. Like, I feel really cool saying it. You know what I mean? It's just quicker than saying going to Comic Con every time. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Anyways, the con. It sounds like a cool bar or something like that. You know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or that you're an escaped convict. It's a bar for con men. 
Ooh, I like that. By the way, I've been watching, I'm, I watched, uh, two and a half seasons of Better Call Saul in like the last week. Oh my god. I'm almost caught up. I'm like on like episode six or seven of Of the third season. Of the third season. Jesus, you're crazy. How is it? How is the second season? Oh, it's great. Is it all, all great? I've only seen the first, I've only seen the first season. It continues to be fantastic. It's, (sighs) it's great. I'm so happy. I love that. Yeah. Also, I I thought I had only watched like the first like two or three episodes. You said this in the last episode. Damn it! Let me tell the whole story again. No, please, God. Um, Jack, my week uh, was, how was fun. Your week? My week was fun. It was, you know, I I read a lot. I but I won't talk about that. We're gonna do non comics related stuff. What did I do? <laughs> I played. Oh, I'm. I think we're almost done with uh, Red Dead Redemption Undead. And nice. oh, it's so good and. Like playing it, playing all these old games, and then like we only have an Xbox 360 right now because mm-hmm. we're planning on getting a what is it a PS4 soon, but we only have one Xbox 360 because we want to play like older games because I haven't played a lot of games mm-hmm. in my past, you know. So um, I don't know. It's really cool to like be excited about new concepts and games and like things that I'm not doing right now. Cause like, these are so much fun, but like thinking about like, for example, Red Dead Redemption two coming out, like in the coming months, it's so fucking crazy and awesome. Like thinking how much better it's going to be, you know? Yeah. I'm so pumped for that game. Und- Undead Nightmare is one of the best, like expand. It's, it's not really an expansion because it's, but it's like, uh, I don't know. It's the best like piece of DLC content I've, I've like played in a game just because it's so it's so out of left field. It's so different feeling from like the normal game. And yet it still has all of the cool parts of it. Well, um, yeah, it honestly fits perfectly. But like at the time I can totally see people being like, Oh my God, them going on the zombie trend, I guess. And like, it's so cool that they make it work so well. Now yeah. with that said, my favorite piece, you haven't played this yet, but there is a DLC for Mass Effect 3 called the Citadel DLC mm-hmm. that is my favorite DLC. It's like this entire big like story, like movie within Mass Effect that happens. And it's like one of the funniest, like most gripping g- gameplay and story wise. Yeah. It's, it's the best thing ever. You got to play Mass Effect all the way my, through. My experience with the Mass Effect DLC is because. I have played bits of those games for weird reasons. Yeah. I, I I want to someday actually sit down and play all of them consecutively. Uh, okay. But um, I is that like the DLC parts of those games are so integral to the plot. It makes me kind of frustrated that they're DLC. Like they're like, they seem so important to like the structure of the games. Mm, uh, I mean, I can see that like some of them, well, like, for example, in Mass Effect 2, they have one that adds a lot and it gets you to, it allows you to play with characters that you were able to even play with in the first Mass Effect that you, they don't have as playable characters in there. So I can mm-hmm. understand that. For Mass Effect 3, for the one I'm talking about specifically, it's just a completely, like, it adds a new location of the game that is completely extra. Like, it isn't integral to the plot whatsoever. It just adds a fuck ton. Gotcha, gotcha. And, but I can see how it is because, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. But like when games do stuff like the Catwoman DLC in Arkham City, that was so frustrating. <laughs> like that. Like, like, what, like you wait, had I don't to... remember. So the Catwoman. Did you play? You you just played Arkham City, didn't you? Or no, you I just played Arkham played Asylum, it? but I have played Arkham City. I played okay. it with you. Did you? You played. So you played with the Catwoman DLC, correct? Um, I think we played the Game of the Year edition, which I think yeah, we had. Okay. Wait, uh, wait, so, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we talking about, wasn't in the base game that you could play with Catwoman every no. once in a while? Really? It is interwoven into the plot, enforced like, and now since you did this story point, now you do this mission as Catwoman. And it's yeah. interwoven into the plot, and you don't get those bits unless they are at specific points in the story, and they flesh out Catwoman's side of the story which like answers questions about her involvement in the story because she's in the story, whether or not you have the DLC. Yeah. But it answers like why she does certain things in the story or Holy and, shit. like stuff about two face and, and stuff. And it like, you don't get, you just, it just skips over them. If you don't have the DLC, 
That's great. I didn't even know that because I've never played like it's, anything other than the game of the year. It's edition. one of the shittiest implementations of DLC I've seen because it's it's so like it's you can't separate that from the story. Like Definitely you are missing not. chunks of the story if you don't play that. It also um, adds so much more to like the game in general. Like that that severely like affects my sort of idea of the game, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's great stuff. But, like, you have to pay extra for it, and that's shitty. Damn. Um, anyways. Shit. Cool. Okay. Well, I mean, not cool. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, whatever. We, anyways. I get it. Cool. Uh, Jack, let's talk about some news. All right. So, news highlights this week. Um... There was a lot of stuff this week. It was hard to kind of narrow it down. A lot of images released, like, of people, and I, I don't know. I thought a lot of them looked cool. Yeah, there's there were some some movie stills and stuff released, but uh, I feel like in terms of the big, like, announcements and stuff, um, the big thing is, uh, at Marvel right now, uh, is that uh, they announced a director for the Black Widow movie, Ooh. which kind of... Well, they didn't announce it. Ho- Hollywood Reporter broke this uh, article. Uh, I don't think it was an official announcement, but uh, it also, sounds... I don't know who this lady is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have much to say about this director, uh, Kate Shortland. But the really the news here is like this is the first bit of like concrete news we've gotten. That, like it's been kind of an open secret that they've been trying to get a Black Widow movie off the ground for about a year now. Yeah. Uh, but like this is the first bit of concrete news that they're like they are like tracking to actually make a Black Widow movie because it's I I've had my doubts that that was going to happen. Oh yeah, a little bit. What now? I I just why would you doubt it? It's such a random thing to doubt. I don't know. She's just not a huge character. Like I would love a Black Widow movie. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I like. I think like I'm really excited if this happens because like just a straight up like spy espionage movie, even more so than like the Captain America movies have been. Yeah, like sound set in the Marvel universe. That sounds awesome. I'm. Do you think this is going to be a flashback? I don't know. I, that would be interesting. I feel like I want to see Black Widow at the height of her game, though. So, I mean, it all depends on the the, the like execution of it. I'm but. looking at this woman's IMDb, and she has not done a lot at all. No, yeah, there's it's a bunch of. Uh, I mean, more power to bunch her. Of I guess. Random stuff. Uh, they Marvel like goes back and forth between like getting big name people and getting really unknown people. Um, but I assume you know she's made some stuff that they they think fit with somehow what they want to do with this Black Widow movie. Yeah. Um, do you think and, um, the DC side doing Lady Blackhawk at all had them like more so want to do this? I don't think that Lady Blackhawk movie is going to be like like a spy movie at all that sounds more like a like a war like pilot movie Eh, i can Uh, see that i guess but uh yeah i i don't know i i think there is a lot of pressure on both of them to make female driven superhero movies just because it's like it's a really big untapped vein like vein and yeah like and they need to diversify their their kind of lineup Oh, yeah. Um, no, definitely. I, I agree uh, completely. Did you hear about the, um, about her dropping out of that other film? About who dropping out of that other film? Scarlett Johansson. What did she drop out of? So there's this whole thing. We won't get into a lot of it because I know you don't like doing a lot of these dicey things, but there's a lot of backlash about Scarlett Johansson being a part of this movie called Rub and Tug, which is, um, oh, her- the one where she's, she was playing, uh, transvestite. Uh, tr- Transsexual. She was playing a, a trans woman. Trans woman, um, I believe. Um, and then she apparently Kevin Feige, or no, that was just a rumor I read about. But no, she dropped out saying like she apologized for any like because people got mad that you know they were using a non trans trans woman for the role, which you know we won't get into that at all. But um, I just thought. It was interesting. I wonder if Disney had a hand in like, you know, this sounds like a hot mess. Maybe you shouldn't be involved in this, you know? Yeah, I don't I have no idea. That's that's all speculation, but I can't imagine that they were happy about it. <laughs> um yeah. Well, she's out now. I mean, she she seemed to exit very, you know, with 
uh, happiness. Like she didn't exit with vitriol or anything like that. So I think I think they handled the situation well if they did. So I don't know. I mean, she's following. It's probably a smart move on her, on her part, like disregarding all the stuff around it. Probably a smart career move for her after all the backlash after uh, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, oh, what was that? Just the the like. They cast a bunch of white actors as, uh, like, she, wh- what was her character's name oh, in Ghost in the Shell? Wait, because uh, that was an anime, right? Ghost yes, it's an show? anime, but, like, it's, spe- like, the, what is, didn't she have, have like, her, her character's name in, they just call her Major in, in the, I'm on the IMDb page, but, like, it's a very Japanese name. Oh. <laughs> the character's actual name. Like, the characters are all, like, explicitly, Japanese in the anime and, and she just has black hair <laughs> yeah they just dyed her hair black it was very questionable uh, um that's too anyways bad. Have you seen that movie? yeah no it looked bad <laughs> anyways oh yeah it just says major it's lame okay weird but yeah so yeah I mean I can see what you're saying for sure but yeah in any case I'm really in any case that was not my number one um I'm really excited for Black Hawk that's awesome or Black Widow that's really that's gonna be really cool yeah, I think that could be that has the potential to be really cool and, and different from stuff they've done. You know what movie in I'm also other... excited about, uh, Doug? What? Walking what? Phoenix in a Joker origin movie. Except, can Are we talk you... about this? <laughs> no, I, I. That's why I wanted to talk about this because, like, it's going to be really problematic and weird to like do a definitive origin movie for this character, like especially after him not getting a lot of screen time. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh... it'd be one thing if they did an origin like sort of bringing to light some things that he did in movies before if he had a lot of exposure already but like this is just them introducing him in general like why but there it's also not connected to the other to the joker and suicide squad oh it's completely separate that's random then because they keep they they there's clearly some sort of internal struggle right now going on at Warner Brothers in terms of whether or not they they like stay the course with their uh their shared universe stuff. Yeah. Uh because they've greenlit like three or four different Joker movies at the moment of all various uh approaches. Um like they're doing uh, like they there was news a while back that they're doing a Jared Leto led Joker movie about that Joker. They're like He's going to have involvement in like, uh, I mean, there's going to be this. Um, I think this is the one that's like produced by Scorsese or something. It's weird. Um, really weird. Very okay. strange. I, but like, this has been a rumor for a while that this has been happening. Joaquin Phoenix has been like slightly open about it, but they're actually officially moving forward with it now. Like they're making this movie. Joaquin I Phoenix hope Joaquin Phoenix there. doesn't get too into this role like he did. Do you remember the thing he did on David Letterman or something like years ago? Jesus Christ. Well, that was like, that was a publicity stunt. No, it was. Like I, but like, I mean, you don't think he would want to do something like it for this? He's a fucking weird dude. He is a weird dude. He seems like, I don't know this. This is, again, this is me just speculating, but he seems like a, like a method actor, like someone who like lives the role or whatever, which, you know. Well, Jared Fucking Leto after, also calls after himself... After Jared Leto, like, yeah. sending his co-cast members on Suicide Squad used condoms and shit, like, when he was playing Joker. Yeah. I'm wondering, Jesus did Christ. he personally use them? One has to assume. <laughs> like, where the fuck else is he getting them? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, like, some sperm bank and, like, just drips Jesus them Christ. in there. <laughs> oh I'm sorry. God. Have you ever been uh, to a sperm bank? Anyways, this is... Ha- so this movie's happening. Okay. Um... <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> Nothing. It's okay. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is a good actor, though. Have you seen... You've seen The Master, right? Yeah. The Master's good. It's a little... It's a little much for me... Yeah. In terms of, like, how messed up it is, and, like, his portrayal is, like... I know he's supposed to be, like, mentally ill, but it's pretty, un- like, hard to watch him in that movie. What if they, what if they like talk about this, you know, Joker origin movie? They don't release a lot of stuff for it, like not a lot of footage from the movie. And then theaters come in and it's just the master. That's the origin movie. Wait, it's just literally they just <laughs> replay the <laughs> master just again. Play the master. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, he paints his face white. 
<laughs> yes. And then at, in black or in white letters, it's Joker will return in. <laughs> no. Jesus. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, in other news. Yeah. So, uh, FX is making a why the last man movie. This is, that's been kind of out there for a little bit, but we got the first kind of big casting. Wait, 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 wait. Did you week. say movie? Did I say movie? FX is making a Why the Last Man TV show. I was going to say, movie would be terrible. God. <laughs> yeah, n- not enough space to tell the... Why the Last Man is a long story. Wow. Um, but uh, the, the that is the seminal comic by Brian K. Vaughn and mm-hmm. Pia Guerra. Uh, and that series, we got, we got casting from that series this week. Yes, uh, we did. The kind of the big news... Uh, Yorick is going to be played by, uh, what is his name? Barry Keegan. Barry Keegan. We were just talking uh, about this. How did you not remember? Because I don't know who the fuck that is. I mean, I know who he is. You do. By <laughs> looking at his face, but I don't know his name. <laughs> okay. Like, anyways, he is fantastic. We, uh, have, like, talked uh, before, not on the show, but me and uh, Actually, that's before, not true. Really on the very first him. episode... The very first episode, our How Is Our Week was, mine was, I just saw Killing of a Sacred Deer, which gotcha. we talked about him in. Uh, yeah, he's really great in uh, the movie Killing of a Sacred Deer. Uh, he's also in Dunkirk, fantastic in that. Uh, I think he's an interesting kind of a left field choice for Yorick, mm-hmm. but like, he seems like a really talented actor, and uh, I like him in, in the roles I've seen him in, so uh, definitely down to see what he brings to that. Yuppers. Uh, and then uh, Diane Lane is playing his mother. Uh, slight spoilers for why the last man this happens in like you find this out in like the first couple issues. But uh, his his mother uh, basically becomes president of the United States mm-hmm. after basically the whole uh, chain of command uh, is decimated. She's a senator and then is like thrust into the role of president. Uh, was they Diane also Lane, announced? Sorry, was what? Diane Lane? Who played Martha Kent in Batman v Superman? Uh, was it? I I swear it was. I don't. I mean, I I assume it would be the same person who played her in. It is Diane Lane. She plays Martha Kent. I assume that's the same. She also must probably played uh, Martha in In Man uh, of Steel. In Man of Steel. Well, yeah, no, definitely. uh, Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, the, they also announced a bunch of the other cast members. I'm not as familiar with, with the rest of them. Imogen Poots is, is in it, I think as his mm-hmm. sister. Yep. Uh, hero. Uh, yep. that's, that's her name. Uh, and, uh, what do we got? Um, Lashana Lynch is playing agent, uh, 355. Uh, uh, I'm so excited to see this. Do they have any word on like, when this is going to be like a thing? Uh, let's see. I don't think they have any kind of release date for this yet or premiere date. Uh, Cause yeah. it's still, but you know, they just cast it, <laughs> you know, uh, and they, they yeah. haven't made the pilot yet. So, uh, we'll see. Uh, next, I'm guessing the, the pace at which TV generally seems to work. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see it in the next year or two. Yeah. Um, God, FX but- is just killing it so much. I love it. Yeah, they've been trying to get this Why the Last Man movie, or damn it, TV show (laughs) off the ground for like 10 years or something. I I, I guess FX FX specifically has probably only been like the last like five years or something. Yeah, but I mean, Doug, it's really, really tough, I think, to like put together a movie that's like eight hours. It's insane, you know, (laughs) to get all that stuff in there. Did I say movie again? Oh, you just said damn it because you realize you said movie. Oh, okay. I was making fun of that time. Gotcha. Uh... (laughs) But, uh, yeah, very excited for that. Uh, I'm very interested to see how they approach that series from uh, uh, in a live-action format. Cool. Uh, bunch, of, bunch of comic uh, announcements this week. Were there uh, a the bunch? One, yeah, I mean, there was, like, they had they teased that uh, Superior Octopus series oh, at yeah. Marvel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Apparently, Titan Comics is doing Blade Runner comics, or will be doing Blade Runner comics. I'm curious. Vaguely heard about that. that. I actually um, watched yesterday. They they released a bunch of... When the Blade Runner new movie came out, they released a bunch of shorts filling in the time between them. Mm-hmm. Did you watch those? I watched 
one or two of them. It didn't, I didn't, I don't know. They didn't really do much for me. So I mean, they don't do much at all. I watch, I really, the one I liked the best was, um, Dave Bautista had one fleshing out his character. Mm. And I thought that was really, really that great. good. I liked, I liked his little appearance in that movie. He, I thought he, he brought something, uh, uh, really unique to that. If that was the short you didn't watch, I would, I would watch that one. It's, it's easily the best one. It's, it's really, really okay. nice. Cool. I'll have to look that up sometime. Yeah. That, God, that movie's so good. <laughs> um, and so is the original, obviously. Yes. But yeah, anyways, beside the point, uh, the, the comic announcement I'm the most excited about, uh, is they finally announced after 10 years now, uh, they're, Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba are doing a third volume of Umbrella Academy called Hotel Oblivion. Ten years? Yep, the last, the last, uh, they, they've done two miniseries of uh, Umbrella Academy, and the last one called Dallas was uh, released ten years ago. Jesus, almost 10 years ago. that's insane. Was it yeah, pop? Did so, it sell well? Was it popular when it was back in the day? I have no idea. I mean, it's very well liked. I have no idea if it like sells well or not. I, okay. I, I think in the grand scheme of like indie books, it probably does pretty well. Damn. I guess. But I wonder um, if this is because they didn't they just talk about trying to get an Umbrella Academy TV show off the ground too? Oh, they Netflix is making one. They're like they're they're in production on that uh, currently. That 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 is a thing that is going to come out. Uh, in probably like the next year. Is that the one like Ellen Page is a part of? Yes, Ellen Page is in that. Cool. Wow. So I wonder if this is like, if they're doing this like sort of to release during the TV show so people are like, oh, and they're going to like do a deal on like the first I wouldn't be surprised if like the timing of the release is somewhat kind of like... Coincidental. But like, and I don't know, maybe them like the creators like getting back together in relation to making the show happen like made this happen i don't yeah. know i don't know what like the inner dealings are but uh they, i mean they've been talking about doing another volume for a really long time okay uh and maybe just like the kind of groundswell f- of like support for umbrella academy that the show has kind of fostered a little bit mm-hmm. kind of urged them to finally make it so are but, there any small series that you've read that like got another like tidbit of story after years like and years of waiting um god um a few years back so have i ever t- talked to you about miracle man at all uh recently you talked because um we talked about like um shazam a little bit and like how miracle man is like an old guy right and he's they just like go into what where the body comes from and stuff right yeah yeah we were t- i think we were talking about it in in relation to the century the century the, the, yes the new we series did. Uh, uh in relation to that and shazam and blah, 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 that. i think that's why i came up though uh but it's a really great series uh by um alan moore alan moore and then followed up on by neil gaiman uh and then i haven't read the neil gaiman stuff uh, but, uh, years, years later, uh, that, that book was like in publishing no man's land for like two decades or something because Jesus. of copyright issues. Uh, they weren't reprinting it in any form. Uh, and finally Marvel won a big legal battle that gave them the rights to publish it. Um, Oh, from Alan Moore from the original publisher eclipse. Oh, uh, be over the, uh, basically the name. Uh, so they got the rights to the story. And so they started re publishing, um, those books and they, uh, in, co- uh, core, like timed with the re-release of the new trades, Grant Morrison did a, uh, one shot, like oversized kind of continuation of it. Okay. Grant Morrison was never involved in the original series. Huh. Uh, and that was really interesting. Okay. Uh, seeing that followed up on like 30 years later, 20 years later or something. Damn. Um, I'm sure there's other stuff. I can't recall any of it. Okay. Uh, but well, shit. that's the thing that springs to mind at the moment. Okay. Well, for everybody who has been waiting for Umbrella Academy, this is, this sounds awesome. I'm really excited to read it. What kind yeah, of book I, is it? Uh, Umbrella Academy? Yeah. Okay. So it's, <laughs> not a murder mystery necessarily, but 
It's basically, it's a bunch of former child superheroes. It's a family of former child superheroes whose adoptive father has died. Okay. And that brings them all back together. Uh, and uh, they have to deal with a threat that kind of spins out from that. Huh. Uh, I have not read the second volume. I'm going to read the second volume in anticipation for reading the third volume because that's just something I have, just haven't gotten around to. But I really love the first volume. Huh. Um, well, shit. Okay, I'm awesome. I, I, I mean, I'm excited. You're awesome. <laughs> Shut up. That's awesome. I'm excited. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that about does it for news. So let's move on into our current books. Cheerio. All right. So a uh, bit of a light week this week in the grand scheme of things. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Um, I've been having some pretty yeah pretty heavy weeks the last the last couple months. Um. But, uh, Jack, why don't you tell the folks uh, what the books were that both of us got this week? The folks at home. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. So, we both got Eternity Girl number five, Superman number one of the Bendis run, Hawkman number two, which wasn't a piece of poo, and Black Science number 37. Oh, and I got, personally, Quicksilver number three and Farmhand number one, which Doug's going to get Farmhand number one as well next week or something. So maybe you're going to. You really should. Oh, my goodness. It's seriously like Uh, one of my favorite number ones that's come out. Cool. Yeah. Nice to hear. Uh, Maybe we'll talk that that in a bit uh, if we have time. Uh, So uh, let's see. Uh, I also got Detective Comics number 984, The Flash number 50, which was the last part of Flash War. Oh, nice. Uh, We finally got, um, after a long time waiting, the first issue of the, what I believe is supposed to be the last volume of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh. Um, But also, I don't know, it's Alan Moore, so everything's always up in the air. (laughs) Oh, that's Alan Uh, Moore? I didn't know that. Yep. Yep. I... So, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, The Tempest, number one, Hmm. uh, and Amazing Spider-Man, number one, uh, part of Marvel's Fresh Start. Fresh. So, what what part of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen does Sean Connery play? Uh, He plays Alan Quatermain, which is basically the literary character who is the inspiration for Indiana Jones. So, he is a um, a character who is, like, uh, an explorer in the... You know, I don't. I don't remember. I think that first. I think he's a character from like the, either the 1800s or the early 1900s. Because okay. um, you love that movie, yeah, right? He explores the unknown and like finds relics and whatever, and uh, hunts big game and blah 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 blah. Because um, you were a huge fan of that movie, right? <laughs> that movie's so bad. Uh, <laughs> okay, but, wait. No, uh, the books are great. Big all- big fan of uh, Alan Moore's Lego Extraordinary Gentleman series. Who like does art for that usually? Kevin O'Neill uh, is the is. artist on those series. I mean, that's the big thing that he's known for is is those books. Okay. Uh, but uh, really great fit. Okay. Uh, anyways, so let's talk about Spoilers. Uh, our book. Spoiler warning. Uh, Jack, Brrr. what was your favorite cover uh, of the week? Well, my favorite cover of the week was Farmhand number one. Look, we are talking about it. Um... Because, and I didn't put you a link, but you can find it, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I really love the coloring on this. I really th- love the style that um, Rob Gillery really uses. He is actually doing all the art as well, I believe. Um, yeah, is created, he- written, and drawn by Rob Gillery. Colors are not him. Taylor yeah. Wells. I don't know who that is. But... I really love his art style. He, I believe, does it on Chu as well. I'm actually not sure about that. Yep. But, He's um, the artist on Chu. Yes. Okay. I think it's awesome. He has such a great, like, I don't know. It, it looks like, it's it's like cartoony in a way, but this book specifically has a lot of really, like, gritty details and dark details. Yeah. And it's really refre- reflected in the cover where you have this, you know, Farmer guy just kind of chilling, eating some hay, watering his crops. But, oh, wait, the crops are hands, like zombie-looking hands coming out of the ground with little veins of blood going out from them and some fingers, like, just coming out of the ground. And he has a gun in his pocket and a lot of money stuffed into his um, pocket as well. 
And they're just like, I don't know, just like this book, the whole image, if you just kind of glanced at it, is, you know, just like a nice, calm little thing, you know, just like it's like a, just a nice, funny book. But then every once in a while, you just kind of look at it and it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And like yeah, one hand is grabbing his arm, his leg and shit. I don't know. I really liked it. I really there's a lot of details in the art in this book when mm-hmm. you look at it. And there's like mm-hmm. a splash that I was going to use for my panel of the week as well. But I figured I'd just say it in here. Like it's it's just takes a either he puts a lot of care into a lot of the art in here and it's reflected in the cover very well. And I love that on the watering can, the thumb is a plant because of a green thumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rob Guillory, I I haven't read all of Chu. I think I read like maybe the first volume. It's always been something I wanted to go back to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I really like Rob Guillory's art. Uh, I know that from the bits I- I've read. It toes this line. Like, it's very cartoony, but also, like, he's able to do very dramatic things with it that always, like, are able to, like, they still feel intense even though they're cartoony. Yes. Um, this and- one, even more than Chu, like, like Chu is way more comedic than this one is. Like, this has comedy elements, definitely, but this has a lot of, like, dramatic pacing within it. It's really cool. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm definitely interested to try this. Um, at next next chance I get, mm-hmm. I'll pick it up. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to be able to even go in to get comics at all this next week. Because well, um, you're traveling before you leave, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm basically I'm on, traveling from tomorrow well, from Sunday through the following Sunday. Jesus. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to get any comics this next week. In fact, I I, I know I won't be able to. But all right. Uh. Yeah, but I next t- chance I get, I'll pick this issue up if my shop's got copies because uh, I'm yeah I'm I'm a fan of of Rob Guillory's art. the The writing is is well done. I don't oh, know that yeah. I've read anything that he's written. Uh oh, really? Oh, um, what has he drawn? That he has he drawn for like Big Two stuff or other stuff that you? All I know of is Chu. Okay, I mean, I just thought, I've I've read he writes it a that bit too. You know that, right? Mm, no, I don't think so. What? I swear he does. I don't think so. It's two people, I'm fairly sure. Uh, um, let me look that up. Why don't you, uh, one second. I'm, I got this right now. Chu, comic, artist. Oh, you're right. John Lehman. Yeah, John Lehman. Okay. It's... Okay. That actually makes more sense then. This is like... I mean, I can see a lot of the comedy f- like similar to Chu... I don't know if it's because the concept is kind of in the same, like, I don't know, not really in the same way. It's, they're I mean, very it's different. like food, food based, but like dark. Like it's, yeah, that's what, I guess that's what I'm kind of saying. But the, I think the writing is really great in this. Like they have a lot of really great, like, I don't know. They, they introduce their family dynamic. They introduce like how this kind of has an effect on that. And there's some weird stuff going on with what's going on in this farm. And, it's it's really really good. I think I I highly recommend, it, especially if you read his writing yet. I'm I did not know he was not a write. He so he's not usually a writer then. I mean I can't say for certain that he hasn't written things, but uh, I I just know the only thing I've read that he drew, which was a bit of chew, uh, was not it was uh, John Layman, not him. So okay, uh, yeah, no, but I, I like think, I like his art a lot. I think the writing is really great. I. I, I, as I said, I think it's one of my favorite number ones that we've read, honestly. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have to pick that up sometime. Big fan. Okay, cool. Doug, what was your cover of the week? All right. So, and I want to preface this by saying I, I really do like this cover, but I had, uh, I didn't, I don't know. There wasn't really like necessarily like a super standout one to me in the books I had this week. I was thinking about doing um, Eternity Girl just because it's so un- unsettling looking. Yeah, I, I, that one's... That one's really good, but it like it's really gross in a way that like I don't like looking at it. Like it's a really good cover, but like and I kept thinking about should I do that one? It's a really good cover, but also like and I know this is on purpose, but like I just really don't like looking at it. Like- <laughs> it's so gross. I know. And I know. So, like we'll give it an honorable I can, mention. I don't know that I can honestly say it's my favorite cover this week just because like you can't I look at it too much. Look at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But I really like conceptually what the cover to Black Science number 37 represents. I agree, yeah. Uh, so, uh, this is a book uh, written by Rick Remander, art by Matteo Scalera, uh, colors by Moreno Denicio. Uh, the cover done by the, that, that art team. Uh, and this cover is... Uh, this series has been building and hinting towards this meeting, uh, these characters who are these weird, like, multiversal angels or something. Like the, are you uh, talking about the praying mantises? No. These things that are at the end of the book here. Uh, these weird angel creatures that are like, like all mantises. looking. In- what are you, what? Don't they look like praying mantises, kinda? They have wings and they're like, they're they're shown to be very angelic in all of their previous uh, appearances. They referred to them as like quote the closest to gods there are. Okay, I get um, that, but their heads are like praying mantises. Sure, like sure, they look very insectoid. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, they they've always read as weird sci-fi angels to me, uh, alien angels. All right, uh, and uh, so they've been we've been getting like little glimpses of them uh, all throughout. Uh, black science every once in a while that they're like watching everything and somehow maybe controlling it or not, or just at least monitoring it. Um, and we're finally in this issue. We've broken through into whatever reality they are in, in which there's all of these weird alien angels and they're all watching monitors of different dimensions. Um, and, uh, the cover here is a kind of a, a different angle on a moment that happens in the issue in mm-hmm. which the main character, Grant Ward, uh, Grant Ward, Grant McKay. <laughs> Who's Grant Ward? Grant Ward. He's a character from agents of agents shield. Of shield. Yeah. He's a great character Goodness. in agents of shield. Uh, <laughs> Grant McKay, uh, is kind of like busting through into their dimension through one of their monitors. And we see it in the reflection of one of these weird aliens, Big bug eyes. Oh yeah, it's actually just um, a copy paste. I, is I'm, it? I'm looking at it right now. It's literally a copy paste of what? Of the moment. Mm. His face is the exact same. No. Yes, it is the exact same. It's the same. It's a drawing of the same moment, but the line work is different. Really? How do you tell? It's a different. It's a slightly different angle. There's more detail on this one on the on the cover. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I, I'll 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 concede. Yeah, it's a, it's the same moment. Like it's the same kind of like facial expression and he's bursting through, but it's a different angle on it. Yeah. Like well more power yeah. to him if he did change the line work for a very similar looking thing. That's actually kind of crazy. Yeah. Huh. Um yeah, so uh yeah, so we're just seeing and when you first look at this cover before reading this issue, I I don't know what this cover is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty it, pretty abstract looking because it's so close cropped and it's like on this figure who's very non-human looking. So it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at. Yeah. But once you've read the issue and then you close the book and you look at it and you go, oh shit, that's what that is. Uh. Uh, and uh, it's just like, it feels cool because once you realize what it is, it feels like this nice kind of culmination of like this thing they've been building towards yeah. the whole series. I think the, the colors are really strong in this issue mm-hmm. uh, oh, or yeah. on this cover. Uh, Moreno Denicio uh, really like makes the, the big pink eye pop uh, and like, yeah, it just, it's it just like, it feels like a really cool image in tandem with kind of what that moment in the issue and the series at whole represents with this series kind of reaching towards its end. Um Yeah. I can and, see that. Uh, I think that's really cool. I was actually wondering why you chose the cover because I just realized that I got an alternate cover. Oh, what'd you get? So I I like this cover too. Um, it's basically Grant and Sarah, um, kind of holding each other, but like they're, they're kind of like uh falling through. Yes, falling the through multiverse. I assume like a bunch of warm colors, and they're falling yeah. towards the center, which is like a I, sun I looking thing. You see it? I yeah, I looked up an image of it. Yeah, um, it's that's nice a cool too. One too. I like yours better though. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, thank you. I made it. So <laughs> honestly, if we're if we're talking about, can we? Are we gonna gotta talk about this now? 
Yeah, uh, as long as we're talking about black science, uh, Jack, this was the book that you were the most excited to talk about. Uh, well, I was because I haven't, this is the first time I've been able to read it, like, you know, up, up to date. So I'm, I'm really happy I got to do it because this is a great issue as well. Um, let's talk about the art a little bit because I think, I think the art in this is amazing and I want to read more stuff by this guy. But personally, mm-hmm. like, I really think it's fitted towards Rick Mender's style, like, in an amazing way. Um, Mm -hmm. and this book really show is, gives him a place to show it off. I was going to pick this for my panel of the week, but I figured I'd just talk about it now. There's a specific page splash where the, and remember spoilers for everybody, um, where the first Grant and Sarah that we talked to, the ones who go into the, uh, antimatter Mm -hmm. before that, the page of them falling through the different layers of the onion is so great. And I think it's so cool. And it's, a testament to this whole series because I think it's so cool that they've been able to sort of develop each dimension that they've been in in very specific, very different ways. And this just gives us, um, what is it? One, two, three, four different pictures of four different universe dimensions that they're falling through. And I think it's so cool that they, that they can come up with kind of a concept, a little, you know, freeze frame of each one. And it, I don't know. I just really love that image. I really love how this is drawn in general. And like, I don't know if you call them action lines, but they use them a lot. Like, yeah, speed lines, speed like, lines. It, yeah. Uh, Mateo Scalera draws, draws some fucking speed lines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he loves them. It's insane. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's really, really good at drawing movement, drawing, like implying motion and giving specifically this, like really intense sense of speed and uh, intensity uh, that like is one of the best fits I've seen for Reprimander's style of storytelling uh, in my time reading his books. Oh yeah. Um, and like also like even with, without the action scenes, when you have the con contrast between the action scenes with those, a bunch of lines and then like the regular, like just straight up, like this is a stable scene it it's mm-hmm. just a nice it gives you this really like sense of calm that mm-hmm. you know yep. you would have when you're even watching a movie or something or you're experiencing it you know like it's just like ah oh, okay now i'm here yeah. <laughs> and like it can either be a sense of terror unsettling it can be happiness it can be comfort and but mm-hmm. it's always contrasted with these big action like oh shit 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 and it's like oh you know mm-hmm. Yeah, he, uh, Matteo Scalera, uh, and Reprimander are both, like, really, really good at, like, providing that range. Mm -hmm. Because they do, yes, do those big, fast action scenes that go on for, like, sometimes entire issues or multiple issues. Yeah. Uh, and then they're also able to do really convincing and, like, emotionally resonant character scenes as well. Like, uh, like, Mateo Scalera draws the shit out of like <laughs> two people talking in a way that like not a lot of artists can like his, his sense of character acting and, um, and all that is, is really strong. I mean, um, yeah, we saw a lot of that in, um, what is it? The God world whole thing. Yeah. Remember that where Grant is just like, I n- honestly, not a lot happens in that six issue period. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all just introspection into Grant McKay's, I wanted to say Grant Ward again. Grant McKay's. I think I said Grant Morrison, psyche. didn't I? What did you say? I think I might have said Grant Morrison. No, oh, I don't, I don't know. Whatever. But, uh, but yeah, that, that whole arc is like not, no plot. It's just like, here's a bunch of metaphorical slash psychedelic kind of like looks into Grant McKay's past and his psyche. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that you, you've been kind of catching up to this series. This was the first issue that you finally were able to read kind of in real time. Yeah. The, I have this s- issue seven trades and then I have this. <laughs> Good God. There's that many. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. They're like five or six issues each. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're, yeah, we're nearing the end here. I think we must I be right. I don't recall exactly what issue this is ending on, but, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're in the home stretch here and it's really starting to feel like it, especially with the kind of, uh, we're going to get some, some kind of revelations. I assume next issue about these, 
these angels. multiversal kind of monitor people. Yeah. Um, the weird angels. Um, Mantis angels. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. but yeah, I'm, but yeah, I'm, I, I'm, yeah. Also, I just want to give a shout out to, I was quite honestly, uh, the, so the first bit of this series was, uh, colored by probably my favorite comic book colorist, uh, uh whose name, uh, has <laughs> escaped me, uh, Dean White. Dean White. Uh, Dean White, who colored, uh, most of Rick Remender's run on Uncanny X-Force. Oh! Through, very, through various artists. Uh, he has this very, like, uh, technicolor, not technicolor, but, like, neon kind of coloring style that, like, I think he, he does the shit out of, like, bright, tech, like, uh, neon colors, uh, in a way that, like, uh, no one else does. Yeah. Uh, and he did the first, like, mm, third or half of this series. Yeah. And then we switched to Moreno Denicio, and I was a little bit skeptical at first. Uh, because I do think the, for the early issues he did felt a little bit like, he was doing Dean White's thing, but not as well. Yeah. Uh, and I felt that change the first time, uh, the first issue that he was on. And I think over the course of this series, he's really come to kind of differentiate himself. He's still kind of, for visual consistency, kept a lot of the, like, the very neon purples and, and turquoises. And Which stuff. I think is nice. Yeah, it keeps it keeps this sense of consistency with the old stuff. But he also brings this very... This kind of like tone of orange that he brings to everything. That's something that is like very much his own. Uh, and the way he, he approaches kind of like everything in a lot of his stuff in the latter part of the series has felt like has a sense of like sunsets and, um, kind of like pastels and stuff in a way that like really sets him apart from. Dean White's approach to the first part of the series. Hmm. And I, I, I have found it very enjoyable kind of coming to really appreciate, uh, Moreno Denicio's coloring on this series, uh, because I think it's, it's come to, to be a really standout part of, yeah. of the latter part of the series. Oh, I completely agree. I didn't even realize, honestly, but I'm, I'm sure I would realize now if I like open up one of the books. Maybe I'll do that today, actually. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, cool. I'm done. Specifically, like, open up uh, the first issue and look at it. And, yeah. Like, <laughs> the, the, the contrast is pretty, is, it's not like, it feels of the same family, but, like, it's, you can tell. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Very cool. So, but yeah, so I'm uh, excited for that. Let's, uh, what do you got to talk about, Dougie? We talked a little bit about this, but let's talk more. Yeah, so, uh, the book that I got to talk about is, uh, Superman number one, written by Brian Michael Bendis, uh, Art by Ivan Reese, uh, colors by uh, who is this? Prado says Sinclair. Oh, Sinclair! Someone Sinclair. Uh, anyways, uh, so this is uh, spinning out of uh, Bendis's and various artists' mini series, weekly mini series, The Man of Steel, mm-hmm. uh, and this is kind of the first issue of Bendis's dual. Superman and Action Comics runs, which I found out recently, uh, is they are going to be monthly titles. But we're going to be getting both of them from him each month. So it's kind of twice monthly, but it's technically two different series. And they're probably going to be slightly different plots. Okay. But, um. And that makes sense that they wouldn't do it like every week. So that's good, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this was the reason, uh, the big reason I wanted to talk about this is that like, I liked Man of Steel. I thought it was good. But, like, at the end of it, I don't know that I was, like, blown away by it. Well, yeah, that's, um, what, that's what I told you last week. Like, it was just kind of yeah. like, okay. Eh. Yeah, I was like, yeah, okay. But this issue really felt like Bendis, like, taking the character, taking the bull by the horns here and just kind of going with it. Yes. And we're seeing kind of what his approach to this actual series now is going to be. Mm-hmm. And it felt like the start of something new and big and uh, important for the continuity of Superman. Um, and I really liked it. Uh, I uh, I like a lot of the 
uh, the new kind of stuff they introduced. Superman's got a new Fortress of Solitude. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's... We're seeing him in kind of more of a dual life in, at uh, the Daily Planet and as a superhero than we have in the recent past. Honestly, in this issue specifically, my favorite moments were when we saw him in the dual life just when he's by himself. Because, yeah. like, we have two... I'm looking at them right now. Like, the first couple pages, uh, or the maybe the third and fourth and fifth pages or something like that, um, we have two pages of the same format. We have... Like, for example, it starts with him sitting alone in bed and then three panels in the middle of him talking with Lois and being happy and everything. And then the last one is him sitting alone in bed. And then the next page is him sitting alone at the breakfast table and then him having three, four panels with um, John talking about school and stuff and then him sitting alone at the breakfast table. Like, I think that... You know, a lot of people, including you, were worried about what they were going to do with John and Lois and yes. everything. And I think what he's doing here, I hope this continues, is they're showing Superman as he's affected by their absence, not just that yes. they're gone, you know? Yes. I think one of the things that really was clarified specifically in this issue is that, like, he, it doesn't seem with what they're doing here. Like, he got rid of them so he can just write Superman by himself because that's what he wants There's to do. There's a thematic reason for it. There is a reason, reason he is removing them from his life in order to use that for character development specifically. Uh, and, uh, like, we are going to be getting... We are still getting in this book, even though Lois and John aren't here currently, we are still getting a story about Superman being a wife... A wife. <laughs> <laughs> being having a wife, being a husband, that. I want that, and uh, <laughs> and uh, being a father, being a husband, being a father, uh, and kind of uh, he, he's worried about Lois and John. That's like the inciting incident for this issue is him trying to find them, mm-hmm. uh, and like they are going to be a presence in this book. Also, this doesn't really have bearing on my enjoyment of this issue, but Bendis has been out there on social media assuring people that. Lois and John are going to be a direct part of his books and very soon. Awesome. So they're not going to be gone very long. He said, I think he specifically said recently action comics starting with one of the early issues is basically going to be a Lois Lane book. Oh, wow. Which I'm very excited about. That's really cool. Okay. But um, let's, I want to talk about another thing. Sorry. I know this is your guy to talk about things, but whatever. No, we're uh, both talking about it. <laughs> we both got to talk about, um, Okay. <laughs> There's an there's a panel at the end. Okay, sorry. Starting with the first thing, John Jones is being weird, right? Yeah, John Jones has got some shit going on, and I don't know what. <laughs> we don't know what at all. I personally, and I talked to you about this earlier in the week. I personally think he's being a little bit um, affected by Jor El somehow. I think that's something going Maybe. on specifically because this last issue or this one of these last panels when Superman's flying through the air, he remembers a moment he had with his father before, just before they left. And it says, I can raise my boy father. And then, um, jor says to do what put out fires in his baby clothes. And Superman's like, that's not what I do. But I think that idea that jor thinks that he's just, you know, putting out this fire, putting out this fire. And he's not actually solving a problem. He's doing this, this, and this, and then nothing ever changes. Really. I think that's an inclination that shit's going to go down with him. At the helm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, so basically what John Jones comes to Superman with is the idea that, like, you could be doing so much more, the world could use your guidance, and implies that he should take over the world <laughs> in, in a very brief moment. <laughs> yeah. And Superman's like, uh, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, he says, take over all of it and set it towards a future in which hope isn't just an ideal, but, uh, and we get a close up on Superman's face, and he says, take and he's like glaring at him. And then, you know, offer. Martian Manhunter kind of <laughs> backpedals a little bit and is like, offer, offer yourself. Watch what happens. So, uh, yeah, like, and we get like a panel at the end of like Martian Manhunter looking very ominous, staring at him as he flies off. But like, there's definitely at the very least thematic, like, uh, mirroring there happening with like, I think it seems like the one of the ideas in this book is going to be like Superman. Uh, like, what more could Superman be doing? Should he be doing 
more outside of just fighting crime mm-hmm. for the world. Um, and uh, whether or not Jor-El has something to do with this weird proposition from much Manhunter, which I think is a good guess, mm-hmm. uh, is yet to be known. But there's definitely like those two things are of a piece thematically. Well, um, even on top of that, like, let's add in the fact that while they're used for comedy moments and there is a lot of comedy within it, you know, these parts where he says, hold that thought, Marsh Manhunter, and he goes, you know, to put out a small fire and then comes right back. I think these things that while they're comedy moments, it actually is kind of telling of what they're talking about. Like, you can't just keep like going off, putting out these small fires and coming back. They're always going to happen. It's going to happen forever and ever and ever unless something changes or unless something happens. So, and then you're the best person, or that's what John's saying. You're the best person to mm-hmm. do that. So it's, I think it's really clever. And I didn't actually notice this till now that, you know, how they have him putting out small fires while John's talking about, you need to change something, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like the whole conversation with John is about like, yeah, you're, you're spending so much time in the minutia of the problems of humanity in the grand scheme of things at the very least. Mm-hmm. Uh, why I like, and he's trying to convince him to do more. And yeah, we are getting while he's talking to him about that every few, like every page he's flying off, like, yeah, taking down some threat and then flying back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I de- that definitely, definitely tracks. Um, and yeah, that, that sequence is probably the highlight of this, of this issue. It's, it's so fun and yet also, yeah, thematically resonant. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause also like, you know, this could just be a conversation between him and John Jones, as boring as that, but Bendis puts yeah. in here something that's both funny, driving of the conversation, and also something that kind of, yeah, it, like you said, thematically relevant and makes you think about, okay, maybe maybe that is something they should do. Yeah, and also it's just like, as a structure for a, <laughs> for like a conversation scene, that's something I haven't seen done before. I think it's really clever. But it's also uh, perfect for uh, Superman specifically, because he yeah, can do I, that, you know, within a conversation. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of stuff that like, that's the kind of stuff that I was excited about in seeing someone like Bendis come over to DC, having been an outsider for so long, is he brings that kind of approach, to, that kind of like different approach to Superman that you don't normally see. Yeah. Um, and that he's able to think about him in this kind of, in this kind of, uh, like, I don't know, like that's kind of see, seeing who he is at his core and using that in interesting new ways, um, that isn't so referential to old stuff that, that he's in yeah, or tropes, tropes of his. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I thought this issue was really strong. Uh, I think this has been, this is for sure the strongest issue of uh, featuring Superman that Bendis has done so far. And oh, easily. made okay. me really excited about uh, the future. Uh, transitioning here into our panels of the week. Yes. Uh, my favorite uh, pa- specific panel in this issue um, is the moment when, so re- in the Man of Steel miniseries, the Superman's Arctic Fortress of Solitude uh, was destroyed, and he had he is making a new one here. He brings a crystal shard from one uh, from the Fortress of Solitude, the re- the remains uh, out into the ocean. Or he, sorry, he spring, brings it specifically, and I keep bringing this to the Bermuda Triangle. Where is the Bermuda Triangle? Can we talk about that? Oh God, I'll look it up. But um, <laughs> so the he brings it to the Bermuda Triangle, which I think is super silly and fun and yeah. they could do some fun stuff with that. Uh it is right off the coast of Florida. It's the it's the space between the three points of floor of uh somewhere in Florida. I don't know. This thing doesn't have this specifically. It's between Miami, uh Bermuda and Puerto Rico. <laughs> so it's those are the three points of the triangle. Dang. And you know, it's that it's that <laughs> place of urban legend where everything goes missing or whatever. God, what um, if like there's some sense of time travel in this and what if like Amelia Earhart gets stuck in the phantom zone? <laughs> I'm sure they're going to play around with like they're, they put it in the B- Bermuda Triangle for a reason. Like there's some like at the very least like it's going to make it so people can't find it or something. Well like yeah that, yeah yeah. Uh, maybe that's the idea but I just really like visually like 
it's not a huge change when you really think about it. Like he's still like he still got the Fortress of Solitude. He it's somewhere different, but it's still the same kind of idea that's isolated. But like I think this gives them so much more. When I first thought about it, I thought like, wow, that's really visually like super different from the Arctic. But then the more I thought about it, like this is actually like gives them a lot more range mm-hmm. with which to you like visually display the Fortress of Solitude. Yeah. So the panel I'm talking about here, the the new fortress emerging out of the ocean in this big epic panel with all these waves and there's a storm and lightning and mm-hmm. water is flowing off in waterfalls all over the new fortress. Uh, and it's really visually striking and epic and cool. Um, and like it has this sense of drama and intensity that like you normally don't associate with seeing the Fortress of Solitude because it's in the Arctic because it's quiet and calm yeah. and isolated. And yet it's the fucking ocean. Like it has so much range in which they can display it. If they want this in the, the moment for Superman to be a very calm, quiet, isolated place, they can make the ocean that if they want, if it's a big dramatic epic moment uh, where Superman's going to the fortress of solitude, they can make it this big epic, like roiling ocean scene. Like there's so much range in which you can, mirror the emotions of the scene to the visual of the ocean. You know, I didn't think um, about that. That's actually, that's actually really smart. Wow. And you know, time will tell if they actually take advantage of that, but like, I'm just imagining, you know, like that they're going to be able to, yeah, like display the fortress of solitude in a way that like mirrors Superman's emotions or the emotions of the scene, uh, or at least gives them the ability to, in a way that they can't really do re- all that much with it being in the Arctic because the Arctic is kind of, for the most part, static. Yeah. Uh, or at least it traditionally how it's shown in uh, uh, in Superman comics. And like, they've, you know, you can have a blizzard or whatever, but that's not really the same as a roiling ocean and lightning and all that stuff. I hate to point out this, like, to beat this theme too much, but, you know, with that said, I was just thinking to myself, like, you know, but, you know, with that said, the solitude is usually like a peaceful thing, but that's not true, especially with Superman right now. Solitude is always changing. It can be a peaceful thing, but without his family here, he also can feel mm-hmm. lonely and feel terrible about himself. So, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe this is this is a good like sort of way to show a change in the character of like mm-hmm. instead of being able to escape from the world now that he has a family, he doesn't always want to escape from the world. Sometimes that solitude reflects something that's terrible in him. Yeah. And I, yeah. And again, yeah, I think this gives them the ability to that, to do that without necessarily chaining them to this specific visual that they have on this page. Wow. I like um, that. I didn't really know why you chose this panel, but now I really, that's really I cool. I mean, also just like as a panel in and of itself, no, it's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. it's a double page splash of the, of the new fortress, like rising out of the ocean. And it's just so epic and, and well rendered. Um, Re- well remembered, remembered. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it's just like, it's really cool visually. And I think, uh, like demonstrates the kind of like flexibility they'll have with, with this as a, a visual in the Superman kind of mythos Yeah, from here on. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I think it's really cool. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this issue and, uh, there's, there's a lot of cool moments in this that, but that was probably my favorite visual. Yeah. All right, cool, big fan. Cool. Well, my panel of the week week is Eternity Girl. This um, mm-hmm. panel of her, it's a one page. Do you call it a one page splash? It's just a splash page. Splash page. It's a double page splash if it's two pages, but if, if it's just a full page, it's a that's that's a splash page. Well, we could call this a double page splash if we include the Conan O'Brien uh, Comic Con <laughs> advertisement on the other side. Oh, did I tell you uh, we're going to go see Conan at Comic Con? Oh, why? <laughs> I don't know. Brian got tickets, but it should be fun. I mean, like, there's going to be big celebrities it's there. Funny, yeah, and whatever. We won't, we won't have to like wait in a giant line to see a panel of like people from some big movie or something. It'll be the same people who are like doing a panel there or whatever. But um, maybe Paul Rudd will be there and he'll show that uh, scene from Mac and Me. It's one of my favorite ongoing stupid bits from a talk show. So great. For anyone who doesn't know, every time Paul Rudd goes on Conan's talk shows, 
he brings the exact same clip from a, a, a movie called Mac and Me, in which a child in a wheelchair falls off a cliff, and he he the bit is he doesn't tell Conan uh, that he's bringing it, but yes, it's very funny. <laughs> Um, Anyways, uh, my panel of the week is from Eternity Girl, and it is this page of her reaching through eternity. Um, No, she's... So this whole issue, she is... They're telling us two different stories, basically. Her on a park bench sitting with Mm -hmm. uh, someone who she's been involved with, kind of normal life sort of stuff, but not really. And then also her with Madam Adam and this god looking dude um in this i don't know crazy metaphorical plane of existence <laughs> and mm-hmm. she's she's mentions that she's in both places at the same time but at the same time in both places she becomes in conflict with herself and she becomes enraged at her i don't know at basically feeling like everyone's manipulating her at the same time which mm-hmm. they kind of are <laughs> but yeah kind of for good reason because this other bitch that's always been her villain is seemingly manipulating her, but maybe not. But I just really like, because this page is kind of the climax of the issue. She's freaking out. And because someone just uh, sent a signal to someone and she just heard it. So she grabs um, the person that was sitting on the park bench with her. And it also shows her grabbing the person that she was fighting in that weird dimensional plane. And they line it up so that, like his, you know, body is on the other dude's body and that she's just there reaching up into both planes of existence. And with the uh, Madam Adam woman standing in the background, just with a slight smirk on her face. And I, I don't know. I really loved the climax, this climax of an issue. And I love that it feels like a climax of her emotional turmoil. And also I love it as an image in that, I love the idea of her reaching through eternity to have both these things happening at the same time in the same um, plane in a way. I don't know. I really liked it. And I love the art in this in general. I love the contrast of the art and it's really specifically shown. Is this pop art? Uh, It's definitely like emulating some, some stuff of like old comic book art, which is the same kind of thing that pop art is emulating a lot of the time. Okay. So, yeah, they have, in this weird plane of existence, they have, like, the old comic booky art, and then they have the new sort of style on the park bench. So this one utilizes squares of that new style with the weird plane of existence style all around it. I don't know. I really liked it. I really like it as a sort of... I don't know. I really like it as a climax of the conflict in general. And, yeah, that was about it. Yeah, it's really cool. We're getting, like, yeah, we're... We're in kind of both realities simultaneously, and uh, we're seeing kind of how she's mentally kind of lining up these conflicts. Mm -hmm. Well, Um, I think they're actually lining up. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But yeah, what did I just want to also get a word like what you thought because you're kind of like iffy on this series in general. I I think this is a really good, really interesting book. That most of the time just kind of feels like it's just going over my head. I don't really, I feel like I have very little connection to what's happening in this book. And I don't quite understand a lot of the time what I'm supposed to be getting out of it. I Again, I think, I think it's very well done and your, your vibing with this, like, could, like understanding it it feels like a bit more than I am. Something about it is just not mentally clicking with me, and I I just don't quite. I don't know. It's just it's a little heady and trippy for me in a way that like is too much for me, and I don't uh, I don't connect with it all that much. Uh, again, I think it's really good. I'm gonna finish it. There's only one more well, issue. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not gonna drop it, but like, uh, and and I and I think it's a good book. Uh, I just for whatever reason can't quite always get my head around what they're doing and trying to say in this series. Well, this one specifically is about the you know the weapon 
and everything. I thought that was a really cool thing where she feels like she is like where I don't know. She ties like her experiences feeling like a weapon to everyone's experiences feeling like just a random thing floating around in the universe. Mm-hmm. How we're all, you know, all of us is four speed timing judiciously applied. I don't know. I thought you didn't think that was profound or anything like that. I don't really know what that means. Honestly, that, that went completely past me. Well, Whatever. All of that. How we're just like, kind of like, you know, it, <laughs> like we're all just hydrogen when nothing of what we're doing really matters. So she's trying to stop that cycle you know but i don't really understand the metaphor of like people as or her or like people as weapons like what this thing of like force speed and timing judiciously applied i don't know what that i don't know well no not as much us in a as a weapon we all can be a weapon in that way but i think at the end of this it's more like it's um what is it she says as if the ties between you don't matter between us as people don't matter as if all of you are is wait as if all you are is what you can be used for you need a function you need your need for function overwhelms you and then all of you is force speed timing judicially applied it's not about weaponry it's about just existence in general sure like (laughs) i feel like i i don't know i guess i get like some of the metaphorical meanings of this, I just, I don't know. I, I have a hard time, fo- like, really understanding how that... I don't know. What the fuck is happening in this book? <laughs> and I like surrealism. Yeah. I just, for whatever reason, this is just that one step further than, like, my brain can really wrap or, wrap my head around. I, I can feel that. In terms of, like, connecting to literally what's happening in it. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I Yeah, I, I'm not... I'm not criticizing the book. I don't it's, think you whatever, are. You're good. Whatever no, reason isn't. <laughs> you get very defensive. Or, like, you don't want it, anybody to think that you're criticizing things. You know what I mean? You feel well, very weird. Well, just specifically with this book, I don't think... Like, I, I read lots of books that I then are... I'm just like, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I generally try not to talk about them specifically on the show. But, like, this book, I don't think this book is not good. Yeah. I, I think this book is good, and I don't connect with it. Okay. I don't... Yeah. Cool, cool. I don't know. Um, Well, let's talk about... Oh, okay. I just... Can we talk about just a little bit about Hawkman? Unless you have to get out of here. I don't know. Yeah, if you want to talk about any of these uh, other miscellaneous books, just, yeah. Just specifically a brief thing on Hawkman. Like, do we... What do we think? Like, I... Oh, I liked this issue. I liked this issue. I just thought it wasn't as good as the first issue. Oh, no. It wasn't as good as the first issue. Um... I, it felt like a little bit of a kind of an in-between, it's a table-setting issue for yeah. what's going to come next. Yeah, like, I um, wasn't really all that into their whole fight in Egypt or anything like that. Like, I just thought it was kind of nah. like, oh, and I don't, I, I hate it when people fight, with, I, I think you share this as well, I don't like it when people fight and they don't talk. <laughs> like, it could be solved by two seconds of talking. <laughs> You know? Yeah, where it's like this whole fight is around a misunderstanding, yeah. and like it could be easily cleared up if one of them would just listen to the other. Yeah. yeah, I find that I also find that frustrating, but I don't think it was like it wasn't terrible. It wasn't, it wasn't like enough of this issue, and like it wasn't like it wasn't like Superman and Justice League. It wasn't like an important plot beat. It was more, I think, just like more to play with the idea of like him having to fight his former self, his like old self. Like, I don't think it was, like, important to the plot of the series. It was just, like, a thing that happened. Yeah. So it didn't bother me all that much. I feel that. Um, but you thought but... it's silly that he's on Dinosaur Island now? <laughs> it's so funny. It's called Jurassic <laughs> Smackdown. So the Like, the last page reveal, he's, like, a pl- page before we get, a place I've heard of, heard tales of, but didn't know I'd ever visited. And then get turn page... Dinosaur <laughs> Island. I, I know of Dinosaur Island. Dinosaur Island is a thing. Oh. But, like, yeah, in the DC universe. But, like, to get a surprise reveal of Dinosaur Island is always, like, the funniest thing. Uh, I don't know if it's supposed to be funny, but it's it just is. Because <laughs> it's dinosaurs. <laughs> it's just, like, to get surprise dinosaurs is so funny. I'm, I'm cool with it. I ain't mad. 
I'm excited. I'll see Hawkman going to Dinosaur Island. That sounds fun. Yeah. I'm pumped. Yeah. All right. I think it I, fits with the, with like he, the kind of him as a sort of Indiana Jones esque character. It does. In the DC universe. For sure. Yeah. So I think that could be fun. Okay. Cool. Well, what do we got going on next week, Dougie? Uh, let me look. I think I actually uh, have this on the thing. So we've got. Let me just pull up my list here. Uh, so I don't know that we're, we're probably not going to be able to talk about these issues. I'm definitely not going to be able to pick these up whether or not me and Jack are even able to record together. Yeah. Um, the next, uh, episode is probably mostly going to be about San Diego Comic-Con and the experience there. Yeah. Uh, whether it's, uh, me and Jack and the guys from Mashing Buttons or just me and those guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I actually uh, have these. We got Avengers... Yep. We have Gideon Falls, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Justice League, which is great. Magic Order. Magic Order. Do you have that? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Oh, I'm reading Skyward next week. We got Ice Cream Man. Ice- oh, are you? Seriously? Yep. Are you sure? What are you looking on? I just I just do like a pull list in this drive based off of comiclist.com. It was on there, though? Uh, I, in my app I'm looking at right now, it says Ice Cream Man number five on July 18th. It could, I could be wrong. Okay. I mean, no, I mean, whatever. Cool. I'm pumped. Um, but Tony also Stark Iron Man as well. Yes. I saw that. And then I don't know if you're getting Mortal Hulk. Uh, how big of a week is this? Let's see. I can tell you. One, two, I'm going to flip through Life of Captain Marvel. I have 11 books. I might not. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know. I'm going to flip through Ca- Life of Captain Marvel, though, because I'm interested to see what it is, because I've never read a Captain Marvel thing. Also, I'm probably going to be getting my books on, like, <laughs> Monday or something of next week, which will be the same week as me getting all my other books. So oh, Jesus. I'm probably not going to try to minimize it a little bit if I can. Um, That's too bad, because yeah, you're also so- not going to be able to get Skyward again, too, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably just end up buying a trade of that whenever. At this point, it makes sense because they might even end it after. Actually, I don't think. I think they'll do a six issue trade, not a four. Yeah. Uh, is that a miniseries? I uh, know it's it's at least going for eight. I mean, it's at least going to eight because uh, when I okay. met the I met the writer and he showed me an image from the from the eighth issue. Cool. Wait. Okay. Awesome. Also, Ice Cream Man's image is it not. Uh, yes, Ice Cream Man is a Okay, so it's not on comiclist.com. I'm lying. I'm on the wrong week. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm lying. Okay. I'm lying. You're right. It is Ice Cream Man number five. Oh, okay. that's exciting. We get to see what's going down. Maybe. I don't know. That series, the the ro- the ongoing plot stuff is like pretty few and far between sometimes. Yeah, but so. we got a pretty Who big knows? cliffhanger last time. Remember the cowboy yeah, dude? But we also got a pretty big cliffhanger in like the first issue and then didn't get any follow up on it for a few issues. So I feel like that's kind of the structure of that series is you get like a big plot, like cliffhangery uh, plot dump every once in a while, okay. and then a bunch of uh, completely unrelated uh, single issue stories. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, that's going to do it for this week. If you made it this far, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we are still, you know, vaguely new. So the absolute biggest thing you can do for us, if you like the show is give us a review or star rating on iTunes. If you enjoyed the show, if you liked us babbling about, uh, all this idiocy here, let someone know about us. Uh, don't call us idiots. Don't. I'm, I'm allowed to do that. You're not. Oh. Uh, you can do that with your mouth or with your mouth. Yes. Jack, are you happy? Yes, thank you. I wrote it in this time for everybody. Mm-hmm, you did. Uh, we uh, release these episodes on Sundays, uh, so be sure to check back in. And next week, we're going to have some sort of special Comic-Con related episode. Yeah. So be better. or Be better? Be, be better, better people. Be better. Everybody. Uh, or uh, better yet, subscribe to the podcast feed and never even have to think about it again. Oh. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's me. Um, well, you can also, you know, you guys, you, you can subscribe um, on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, and Google Play Music, probably others. But whichever one you prefer, we've got it covered. Ah, I like the name. Um, in the meantime, before the next episode, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook under the handle at Comics Covered, as you'd spell it. Uh, you can also find web archives of all our episodes at Comics Covered dot libsyn l-i-b-s-y-n dot com our feet um our youtube channel and facebook also has a lot of episodes video versions in fact not videos but video versions they are videos <laughs> i don't know if you want to get a hold of us with a question or feedback send us a message on facebook or twitter at our or at our email comments covered at gmail dot com thank you everybody for listening you are jack and you are doug ah. It's been Congress Covered. Cheerio, everybody. Cheerio.